So I think that as folks are trickling in, let me, without any further delay, let me begin the uh, uh, talk today. Let me begin introduction to our distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Dr. John Smee from Qualcomm, uh, who is a VP of Engineering at Qualcomm Technologies. Uh, he joined Qualcomm uh, in 2000 and uh, has made uh, major contributions to the space of 3G wireless as a whole uh, uh, and uh, holds many patents and uh, probably there is no one be you know, better today to actually talk about what's happening with the space of 5G uh, and uh, he is a focuses mainly on signal processing baseband aspects, but I'm sure that as a VP, he has much, much broader responsibility. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, interesting thing uh, is, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that there's probably no bus in the space of no additional, no more bus beyond uh, 5G. There is a lot of things happening in so many spaces of communications, but everyone is interested in 5G, and uh, I think uh, this probably is going to be the most ante anticipated talk of the series, I would think, uh, given proximity to Qualcomm, but also all the interest. So without much for, uh, further delay, let me have John come and give a talk. The, the talk is realizing uh, 5G's full potential. Uh, now, uh, John didn't send us an abstract, but I think uh, uh, we roughly know what 5G is all about, and I think we are all eager to hear about the potential of 5G. So, uh, please, come on. Thank you. All right, well, thanks very much for that uh, introduction. It was my pleasure to actually have been in this room uh, last Wednesday for the CWC kind of seminar uh, series where we had uh, some interesting panels on 5G. But what I want to do in today's talk is kind of take you through a little bit more on the technology side and then also pose some of the interesting research and, and development and design challenges. So as you're looking at your coursework um, you know, for your program here, the question is, you know, we're it, amidst all this technology aspect and the ecosystem aspect of how wireless networks get deployed you know, in, in 2018, 2019, 2020, what's really the math behind it? What's the signal processing behind it? What's the network architecture stuff behind it? So we have engineers working on all those aspects. And so I wanna kind of give you some of that flavor about how we're approaching it and then uh, why we're doing what we're doing in terms of the, the technology side and how it fits into the relevance of it actually being deployed. And, um, and so if we kind of take a step back, so one of the things when you look at 5G, it is important that you look through the lens of well, what really is you know, the cell phone used for today? Where, why do, what are the future devices? So when we designed 4G, uh, we're still kind of in the flip phone era, those nice little silver flip phones that Many of the uh, young master students in the audience may, maybe your parents used them when you were a toddler. Uh, but the reality is that um, things have really changed in how we approach uh, as an ecosystem cellular. And when you look even at cellular and you look at Wi-Fi and you look at technology, what really is computing versus communications? And so it's important we kind of look back to what we call the kind of Gordon Gecko phone from Wall Street uh, fame, which was, I guess was a 19... 88 or 89 movie, and this was what was the phone. And then uh, we looked at kind of that transformation as we entered computing. And so the phone now, when you look at the computing capabilities, that's hugely different than it was uh, in the beginning, where you might have a you might have been able to play tic tac toe on your phone, but you certainly couldn't do uh, what people are doing now in terms of you know the photography aspect, the signal processing aspect, um, not to mention the imaging side. And the other thing is industry. So. You'll never hear a talk on NEG. And to be honest, when we looked at 4G as well, uh, the whole point was, hey, how are we going to kind of expand the wireless ecosystem? So it is, I would say, important, you know, now more so than ever, that when people look at 5G technologies and you're looking at, you know, designing networks for reliability or designing low latency signal processing architectures, you're saying, hey, how can I use this beyond, you know, what we already know? And what we already know, as we said, is is say a human holding a smartphone watching Netflix. So that's exciting. And obviously we want to do that better in 5G. But if that's all we do, then we haven't really lived up to the promise. So that aspect of how can we look at edge computing, cloud computing, I understand there was a speaker from Azure, um, you know, Microsoft, um, kind of looking at the kind of cloud computing side of 5G, or not of 5G, but of cloud computing in general. And if you look at that market, that's one of the things that's really changed in the last 10 years is the presence of whether it's Amazon Web, you know, Google Cloud, uh, AWS, uh, Azure, that reality is that changes how people compute and how industries compute. And so then the role of the edge, that is the edge of the network and the latency of the network starts mattering more. So we don't want to want to put 5G just in the box of, hey, it's a radio that's higher data rate. It really is important to think of what we call topology in the industry or the network architecture. So what's happening 
Where is it happening? Why is it happening? So as students uh, in this stage of your careers, it's very important to think in those dimensions. So kind of then taking this step back again, this aspect of if, if you were to kind of do a thesis on what is 5G, then it really it was kind of born out of this reality that the there was kind of a 10-year decade, um, kind of 10-year once per decade pace to the aspect of big enough steps that the industry as a whole decided to make a new non-backwards compatible air interface. So in the specifics, what it means is that if a given operator, like a Verizon or Sprint, AT&T or Timo in the United States had, you know, example, 10 megahertz of spectrum, at what point did they say, I want to put something on that spectrum where the old phones can't talk to it anymore? That's what non-backwards compatible means. So an LTE is a new air interface. It's a different way of doing things. So 4G LTE is different than 3G CDMA, and 3G CDMA was different than 2G C, um, you know, GSM. So these are the aspects of the system changing. So in the earlier 1G, we went from analog to digital, and 2G, 3G, 4G are all digital, but we went from, you know, you know, as we say here, GSM, IS95 CDMA, you know, started by Qualcomm, and then this aspect of WCDMA and EVDO, kind of taking data onto a wireless network in 3G. So you actually had IP connectivity in 3G, whereas 4G was all about, you know, bringing OFDM, wider bandwidth, massive MIMO, those sort of techniques to more broadband networks. So everything we're doing today on our 4G LTE smartphones is something that's taking a digital air interface, improving spatial efficiency with more antennas, more reuse. Um, but at the same time, it's still basically 4G is a better version of 3G in the sense of the air interface capabilities. And 3G was a better um, implementation of 2G that also brought in IP connectivity. So with that kind of backwards facing perspective, when we pivot and look forward, then the question is, what's 5G really going to be? Is it going to be better than 4G in an error interface spectral efficiency, you know, bits per second per hertz? Or we would often say bits per second per hertz per square kilometer or per cubic meter if we look at volume uh, in an office building or volume at a, a baseball stadium or in a you know, campus like UCSD? What's the data um, in a cut set sense flowing within the network? And how can 5G better address that? So then it's something also then we look at, well, where is it going to be deployed? How is it going to be deployed? And so this is the other aspect to cellular networks. They're successful when they get broadly deployed. So we're all familiar with very technologies that looked exciting. We were enthusiastic about it as engineers, but it never quite took off for, the right, for various business reasons. And so that's also important as engineers. And one of the things that you know, differentiates us um, among other academics is that we always try to look for solutions to practical problems. It's not to say that it's not hard problems or they're not futuristic problems, but they serve not only a consumer need or a kind of um, uh, humanity need, but they also have a business reality underpinning why people are going to invest in that technology. And so this is something where for devices to take off, you need there to be widespread availability. Who's going to make a cellular connected <laughs> smartwatch unless there's a lot of cellular connectivity? Right? You, no one's going to say, hey, I'm going to make this new device and it's going to work in 1% of San Diego. Then he's like, well, you know what? Tell me when you hit 50% of covered you know, zip codes or covered people in terms of population coverage. And even when government grants Spectrum or when someone wins an auction to deploy Spectrum, uh, it, whether it's in the United States or I was talking with, uh, with Mesh about like the Indian Spectrum situation as they're looking at provisioning Spectrum for 5G and uh, how is that going to happen in which bands are they focused on relative to Korea, Japan, China, or Europe, the reality is there's a build-out requirement that operators face when they acquire Spectrum because they're basically using, it's like real estate. If someone were to say, hey, I'm going to buy a, this old stadium inside in, uh, in downtown San Diego, there's like, okay, great. A developer bought the stadium, but I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to like wait and hope the land appreciates. The city is going to be like, well, that doesn't make sense. I wanted economic activity. I wanted... I was assuming you were going to do restaurants, shopping malls, schools, something that generates uh, economic good. So that's the other point is that Spectrum is a resource. And because of that, a technology like 5G, it's important to think of, well, how is the Spectrum going to be used? And even how is it going to be reused from a regulatory standpoint? So it's not so much that Verizon bids and they automatically get a certain band across the entire country. No, the, the auctions are done uh, in much more localized sense. So you have a bidding strategy, but it is something where you look at um, in each particular market, it's a competitive bid situation. So the, uh, you don't automatically get the whole city of San Diego. It's done in different um, smaller regions of the spectrum process. And the only reason I mention that is when we look at new applications, 
we look at, say, connecting industries, you might have an interesting application for deploying something that makes sense downtown, or maybe it makes sense in a factory, or maybe it makes sense in a school. The question is, is this, how does the spectrum rights fit into that? So it is important as students to kind of take a step back. And so when you look at that connectivity and you're looking at the services, so how do you map low latency? What does it mean in a wide area sense versus what does low latency mean in a low area sense? That is in a more focused, um, localized deployment. So the deployment topology, something where we looked at the old days, you would say, oh, there was macro cells and then there was pico cells and then it became small cells. And now we've reached nirvana. We've gone smaller and smaller and that's the solution. And the reality is it's not as simple as that. When you look at topology, uh, people are still going to expect coverage when they're on the highway. They're going to expect coverage when they're outdoors. They're going to expect coverage when they're indoors. So how topology gets deployed, that is how are some interesting techniques, whether it's on the Mac side or the multi-cell coordination side, or what's the backhaul connecting those sites. So from a technology standpoint, all of those, the latencies of all those links, the cost of deploying those links, the bits per second per hertz, that is a spectral efficiency that you can offer in the broader network, all matter a lot in terms of how new services get deployed on that network. And so if we look at what, was some, what are some of the industries that are, are actually focused on trying to leverage 5G, I think one of the things that is fundamentally different is there already the number of meetings, for example, that I've had with whether it's companies that are focused on industry factories or whether it's automotive industry, I was talking with some of the professors earlier this afternoon on the goal of, of having, you know, connected vehicles sharing information with each other. Uh, we talked about healthcare as well. Um, what is the notion of the healthcare information that's useful, not only to an ambulance, could be useful to your, your doctor, it could be yourself monitoring some data predictive to uh, potential, you know, future events. So the aspect of what is that reliable access to data? Precision agriculture, also something that's discussed where how can we improve, you know, whether it's yield or whether you're trying to improve going from the farm to the uh, shopping mall, the shopping center. You know, we all go and we, we look at the lettuce and should we buy this lettuce or not? And how fresh is it? Was it frozen? Was it not frozen? And you look at the entire distribution cycle from a logistics standpoint, what can be done better there? So there's a lot of areas where if you're the government and you're saying, hey, uh, you work for the, um, the government of a country, it doesn't, doesn't have to be the United States. And you're saying, what's the goal of deploying a technology like 5G, like putting that spectrum into the hands of operators and allowing uh, infrastructure to get deployed? And should you be allowing people to dig up roads to put in um, fiber for more base stations? Should you be putting roadside units uh, on the road that can communicate with vehicles? The answer is you would look at, well, what's the economic and the benefit to society? What's the benefit to the people who live in my country? Right? So that's the question that people will ask from the government standpoint. And that's why you see this, this kind of range of industries where we say, we're good, if we're going to do this, why are we doing it? And that's the, the whole kind of aspect of the overall kind of cellular economy. And we look at this in a obviously expanded uh, economic sense to get $12 trillion. Obviously, that's, uh, I'd love it if that was uh, Qualcomm's revenue. So we're a little shy of that still, maybe by a factor of 500 uh, or so, but it is something where we look at um, the expansion of economic activity. So things like when someone's ordering an Uber today, are you thanking the people who designed LTE? Probably not, but you're thinking, oh, this is a great service. I'm getting this car. It's showing up on this nice little screen that's showing me where the car is and uh, I can click pay and it's automatically you know, done through my credit card. So the reality of what's happening behind the scenes uh, in these scenarios are something that 5G is trying to address. And so that's where we, I just want to make sure that as a level set, that when you look at the, the problems and as you're kind of drafting this kind of chapter one of your thesis as per the assignment, you're thinking of the use cases in a more generalized sense, but then looking at the technology, the specific technology that enables that. So what kind of comes together to enable some of those use cases? And so as part of that, I mentioned then some kind of three types of services. You can think of mobile broadband, which is the example of the better Netflix, or even the fact that content is being uploaded a lot now. So you know, in terms of user-generated content uh, versus just watching broadcast, right? And then you look at mission-critical services. So these are things that typically would not have been on wireless. So these high-reliability, low-latency services, uh, is it a connected drone? Well, that's an easy example to point to. Obviously, it's more like healthcare. You can think of a connected ambulance. You could look at something that is a mission-critical. It's not like you're doing it for entertainment. It's actually something that has high, um, you know, requirements, that is stringent requirements, to meet. And the other thing is massive Internet of Things, where it's 
low power, low energy, wide area. So you're saying, am I going to put a sensor on a particular crop or on a particular, you know, there was a discussion last week on connected cows where, and they really meant the animal. And the answer was, uh, well, for farmers, that could be very interesting if they can increase, um, you know, the health of the cows and when it's the right time to milk them, then that's actually pretty important to their business. And so this massive internet of things is all about wide scale. So the other interesting point is that whenever you have like three vertices that define something, a lot of the interesting stuff's in the middle. So we shouldn't get kind of caught up in the endpoints of this use case, but rather how do we design an error interface that can morph so that when it's deployed, maybe some interesting future use case comes that's not exactly, you know, watching Netflix and it's not exactly controlling a drone, but maybe it's outdoor AR, VR, or it's some other use case that lives within the convex hull of these use cases. And then because of that, and I mentioned the spectrum angle, we have to look at high bands, mid bands, and low bands. So low bands propagate, quote unquote, better. And what it means is for a given, you know, if you look at the aperture size and the wavelength and you do your, you know, four pi D over lambda and you do your link budget, the aspect that low bands um, can, you know, permeate through walls and windows better. Millimeter wave gets closer to light. It doesn't really go through walls and windows all that well. So that kind of, on one hand, that makes means your network has to be denser because you can't go through as many obstacles. Well, the flip side is that you can reuse your spectrum more efficiently spatially. So if you do a millimeter of network and then you're doing it indoors and you go 10 offices down, you can probably reuse the same spectrum. So if you have, you know, X hundred megahertz uh, of spectrum, then millimeter allows you to reuse it more frequently. So your capacity in a given area is much higher. So we look at capacity and coverage as dual ends, but they're both important for different use cases. And that's why we talk of these diverse deployments, whether we have macro cells, small cells, something techniques like integrated access and backhaul, et cetera. So it's important to think of the air interface of, you know, what are we going to transmit and receive? What are the frequency bands we're going to use? And then how are we going to deploy the network? And then this is just a few more examples, and you'll have the slides as well, where I'm not going to walk through all of it, but this aspect of what are some of the techniques that enable these different use cases. So mission critical, you know, we talk of, of you know, private networks or ultra reliable, low latency communication. So how low does latency really have to be? If you get to a connected vehicle application and there's a bunch of cars driving in a row, what we call platooning, or you're trying to see a car ahead or see an information that's, uh, you know, a car to your left is noticing in its lane, how quickly that information gets over to your car, all of a sudden, you know, latencies on the order of milliseconds or less start becoming very relevant. And so you can look at the role of positioning and you can look at various things about how they come together. So just so you know, kind of by way of, of you know, why there are these global standards for 5G, and you can look at the bottom there, these are the numbers from the ITU, Inter International Telecommunications Union. So this is like a super, um, you know, long operating, you know, um, you know intergovernment type agency where many, many different regions come together to talk uh, about what they think the next generation should be so that as they all um, allocate spectrum, the spectrum is kind of geognostic, but they do want to think of what, why are we trying to do this? And so these are the numbers they agree to. And, and um, you know, various companies, ours included, are part of the input into this process, but they kind of end up with a simple set of numbers about what has to get better or improved, whether it's like latency, throughput, spectral efficiency, connection density. So you can start thinking of as you're analyzing certain techniques and saying, well, what simulation should I run? Uh, what analysis should I do? What trade-off should I investigate? The reality is if you want to be making at least one of these six ones better, and are you going to make it exactly 100 times better? Not necessarily, but it's a bunch of techniques coming together to achieve these gains. And so you can look at, at how spectrum gets brought into bear, and then also how um, a lot of these different techniques on the radio side or even on the protocol side work together to lower latency or increase the density. And so just from, from a, a standards timeline, and you don't have to be kind of experts in this, but the reason your phone works when you got off the airplane in China or Chicago uh, or Europe is because it's a global standard. So your cell phone is talking to a base station from Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, Samsung, or ZTE. And the answer is that uh, companies like Qualcomm and, and our competitors, well, make sure our phones and our, our chipset devices work with all these, uh, these vendor ecosystems. And so that's what enables us to all deploy a particular technology. And so we all kind of move lockstep in the sense that we just finished release 15 and now we're in release 16. We had a meeting last week in Spokane, Washington and kind of some more decisions were made and we're moving through certain 
study items, whether it's integrated access and backhaul or a technique like NOMA, non-orthogonal multiple access on the uplink. So the study items finish for those particular items are moving to work items. And so there's studies where a bunch of companies, kind of like a Globecom or ICC or a technical conference get together and they compare ideas um, and they kind of showcase their results. And a study item then is when the industry is debating a topic. And then a work item is when they're writing a spec. So we call those SIs and WIs. So even a given, uh, what we're not showing here is that release 14 was one big study item. So all that stuff I showed on the prior slides and a lot of work that that our team did was kind of debated in release 14. And in release 14, we kind of adopted a framework. So across all the industry, this is what we're gonna, gonna go for in terms of trying to have a spec. So there was a lot of specifications about um, you know, what was the work item description for what we we're gonna tackle in release 15. And so the industry decides, okay, we're gonna focus on something so that we can have a spec that's ready here and a spec that for non-standalone and a new spec that's ready Standalone means it has a new core network. Non-standalone means that use the LTE core network. So the point is that the industry as a whole operates kind of like a huge, massive, multi-company project. Uh, so it's very complicated and it's split into all these specific working groups, one for physical layer, you know, there'll be one on security, one on network architecture, et cetera. But the answer is that there's a lot of engineering work that goes into each and every little part of this. And then in the end, it gets kind of... Um, you know, translated into an overall specification. So this kind of defines the timeline. So when people say, hey, we're going to be ready to, to launch this system uh, in first half 19, it's because of the fact that we have the specs, um, you know, December um, of 17 and in June of 18. So those specs take a while to get implemented on the base station and the chips, uh, but then the, the chips will be in devices. So for example, Qualcomm's chip for release 15 is already in phone, just being brought up now. And it'll be something that'll be in, in you know, the, for example, uh, the operator stores in the first half 19. So this, there's kind of a long time frame where you have devices showing up here, but the work really started like five years ago. And on the systems engineering side, it started even earlier. And so if we look at some of the technologies then that kind of get at the specifics of, you know, whether it's research on channel coding, I was just talking to Alex Vardy on polar coding, and obviously polar coding and LDPC coding are the, the codes that are chosen for the control channel and the data channel respectively in 5G. So a lot of specific work on coding is something that enables us to say, achieve higher data rates or have more energy efficiency. No one's gonna want 5G if, hey, I can do twice the data rate, but your phone's gonna have like last half as long. And so by lunchtime, you're already looking for where to charge your phone. That doesn't really make sense. So how can we be more energy efficient? So there's silicon improvements and RF improvements, but there really has to be improvements in the actual air interface. And the other thing is we mentioned we wanted to support all these different bands. We wanted to support a lot of different scenarios for latency. So in the early days, a, a, a cellular system would just have a given latency based on its, its frame structure. And whereas in reality for 5G, we designed a scalable slot-based frame structure where different services, kind of like QoS, quality of service, could happen on different frequency bands and could happen with different time scales. So how do you kind of build a chessboard that has this scalable aspect to it, that's how you can achieve different data rate latency requirements all on the same network. So the operator wants to deploy a given number of base stations with a given you know, horsepower in terms of the, the RAN, whether it's cloud RAN kind of base stations or silicon at the actual cell site. But the answer is your network needs to support a lot of different services. So what are the designs happening in the multi-cell coordination, but then in the overall operation of a slot-based framework? And in some of the kind of key enabling RF techniques are massive MIMO, where you put a large number of antennas, but more importantly, you bring a large number of RF streams down to baseband. So antennas were always like about this big in cellular systems based on the frequency band. And there was a lot of like antennas arrayed up, but you just have an, you know, a single um, you know, connector for that whole panel. It was RF beamformed. It was like from the baseband standpoint, it was just one connection. Whereas now you're bringing a lot of that stuff down to baseband across all those antenna elements, and that's what allows you to do the spatial steering. So a lot of interesting um, you know, matrix processing can happen in baseband based on bringing multiple streams down. So for as an example, you know, we're building a massive MIMO system at Qualcomm campus with 64 streams brought down where we can achieve you know, in a given sector, sure, 120 degrees coverage to get the sector, but it's actually split up into our ability to do specific azimuth and elevation steering. So bringing that, all that down to baseband is something that enables advanced algorithms to do multi-user 
stuff where you're, you're having multiple users being served at the same spectrum at the same time. And then also MIMO where it's higher than rank one. So if your device has more than one antenna, which it almost surely already has at least four today, then it'll be able to kind of decouple these signals based on projecting it on these kind of almost orthogonal bases. So the signal processing at the device side can separate streams, which allows MIMO. So, you know, hopefully you guys are familiar with some notion of this spatial multiplexing benefit, but it's one of the key reasons that even 4G itself was more spectrally efficient than 3G was that you're spatially overloading. And by spatial, I mean, it's like in the air at the same time and you're using antennas to separate them out. The other thing is that these higher frequency bands are inherently more directional. So if you look at frequency domain, uh, I'm sorry, at, at millimeter wave spectrum, it's very high band, it's very small wavelength. And the only way to actually achieve range is to steer that energy in a very narrow beam. So because you're steering the energy, instead of like kind of radiating it like a sphere, you're radiating it like a more directed flashlight. So that directed energy can go farther for the same you know, power because it's going right to the intended recipient who gets the SNR advantage. But the point is that because it's that spatial processing, that actually can serve two people at the same time because there's no mutual interference. So the spatial overloading of the system is, is one of the most important parts that has allowed cellular systems in the last you know, 10, if not 20 years to increase capacity because we're actually always overloading it in a spatial sense. It's not like one base station transmitting from one antenna and one user at a time. It's actually the fact that it's, it's a very complex geometric spatial distribution. And then millimeter wave is a, these high bands that have been used for many applications, like military applications for a long time. But can you put it in a smartphone? Do you have the, the power, size, weight, the beam forming algorithms? So a lot of the interesting work uh, for those of us on the R&D side is in the interplay. So sure, we need to have like expert uh, channel codes, but we also need to make sure the fact that the, the stuff we're doing um, at, at millimeter wave for beam search and beam tracking is consistent with this overall operational framework of how often things are happening. So the interesting thing is a system designer, you say, hey, I wanna do this thing, and I'm gonna measure this particular commodity, like a SNR or a channel state information. I wanna tell the base station that, I wanna relay it back to the base station. Well, how often can you do that is gonna be a function of not only the error interface, like when's your chance to transmit versus your chance to receive, because this is TDD spectrum, but it's also about how fast you can process things from a Moore's law perspective on base the device side and the network side. So long story short is the whole system is faster, but a lot of the sophistication that the engineers have to do to make these technologies better is about making sure it's, it's fully consistent end to end in terms of what are you measuring? When are you relaying it? How are you mapping that into the system? And so that's kind of one of the fun parts is that to actually be successful in this technology as an engineer, you have to work with many, many other types of engineers, whether it's hardware, software, firmware, network architecture experts, uh, because of it, you can't really have the whole system work unless each component is doing its job. John, John, yes. Quick question. Yep. In the, in the millimeter wave, do you see any interesting uh, trade-offs between uh, MIMO capability versus beam forming capability? Yes. So that's a good question. So on millimeter wave, so the question was about MIMO um, basically versus you know range. And so the answer, whenever you do MIMO, the that is multiple signals or multiple like data streams to the same user, you're sharing power. You're, you're having to put like typically half the power on each of those like rank one, rank two signals. And so the reality is a millimeter wave, oftentimes because of the propagation challenges, you say, you know what, I basically wanna do rank one. I wanna put all my energy on one beam so that I can like withstand the fact that the user just walked around a corner and I'm doing a reflection versus a direct line of sight. So a millimeter wave might have like rank one or rank two. We think rank two is pretty reasonable uh, because you, get, uh, you can actually get um, polarization diversity quite reasonably. So polarization is kind of from electromagnetic uh, standpoint when, you know, depending on if you guys have studied your, your undergraduate kind of physics carefully and, and, and um, in terms of how the propagation is able to kind of get resolved, then, um, you know, kind of Maxwell's equations type stuff. It is this thing where for millimeter wave, yeah, it'd be kind of low rank, whereas for sub six, you would often be able to actually do rank four because you have enough energy to get farther so you actually say, you know what, you're already getting enough SNR to de demodulate 256 qualm, um, you know, many bits per second per hertz. So I can actually turn on another stream for you. And you'd rather have two 64 qualms than one 256 qualm because of the logarithmic nature of the alphabet. So for higher frequency bands, as you get very high, it's true, you want to put more of your energy into beam forming just to kind of close the link. Whereas in the lower bands, even though you're still going to do beam forming, 
you're actually able to kind of increase to higher rank. And so then this is a little bit just, you know, kind of reiterating some of the points before of how do those different um, kind of, whether it's prototyping. So if you look at system design, and I, I had a kind of very good chat um, with, with some of the, qual the professors here at UCSD who are working on kind of prototyping networks. And so prototyping is obviously pre-commercial, but it's when you build it and try to understand it and learn the trade-offs. And so for many technology uh, industry folks, that's a very important part of the ecosystem because it's when you can experiment and there's not this kind of commercial pressure of like, we're going to sell 100 million of these. It's more like, let's figure out the algorithm. So let's go beyond simulation to over-the-air measurements and analysis and build it. And then you can really understand some of the trade-offs. And then the aspect of this kind of global ecosystem of trials and, and um, you know, device side. And this is some of the work that, um, that we did where... Um, you know, I was in, whether I was in China or, or, or um, Sweden or, or the team with Nokia in Europe, there's a lot of work where you have to work with the ecosystem to kind of have these um, proof points of the technology to kind of prove that it's coming together. So this is just a lot of the aspects of um, uh, to be successful in the, in, kind of, in the telecommunications rollout, you really need that global interoperability. And because of that, um, the kind of a lot of interesting work on and how do we all kind of work together to enable that? Uh, so this is kind of an interesting question to kind of uh, your question, Nambi, in terms of, you know, millimeter wave. So one of the points of, well, if I have this path loss for millimeter wave, how am I going to overcome this challenge? And the answer is, well, you can kind of, if you're reusing your LTE cell site and you're kind of having that density already in your LTE network. So if you go to Korea and you ask at SKT or KT, like some of the key operators or LGU+, Plus, the reality is in, in downtown Seoul, the base station are already like 100 meters apart or 75 meters apart. They're so close, the notion of these macro cells is a little fictitious already. And because of that, millimeter waves, not, you're not trying to go five miles. You're actually only trying to go 100 meters. And so this really helps the millimeter wave deployment. So the operators, for example, in the US, there's several operators who want to move quickly to deploy millimeter wave, uh, even you know in early 2019, as they're doing this, they're leveraging the fact that they have this dense LTE networks already and that you can overcome the challenge of the, the path loss. And so the other thing, does it work only in line of sight? You know, when there's blockage from your hand or from, you know, reflections or foliage. And the answer is you have a lot of this non-line of sight operations where there's reflections. And so beam management, we have many, many engineers working on beam management because it's like, how do you manage all these beams or do handoffs between cells, beam-based mobility? So when you look at the spatial side and the signal processing side, you want to be thinking of that kind of analysis of how quickly you need to switch beams in order to be moving, say, at 30 kilometers an hour through a bunch of buildings. So if someone's driving, say, through the UCSD campus, what's the series of you know, um, handoffs that are going to need to happen for that person not to use their connectivity? And so that's one of the things where, from a first principle standpoint, you do kind of have to go back to, oh, what's the speed of light? How fast are these things happening? Uh, what's the difference between the base stations? Uh, how fast do I have to switch? What's the latency in the air interface? So a lot of these different things come together to solve a particular, um, you know, physical reality. And so the other one is like fixed use versus wireless use. And so that aspect of how do you have ro robust mobility in millimeter wave? Or, you know, from a form factor standpoint, how can you put large numbers of beams within a single smartphone? And so we do a lot of work with, with uh, specific, um, you know, device mockups in terms of how you're holding the device you know, in terms of the, the grip and how to make sure you're not blocking all the antennas at the same time. And so this is just something where these new use cases that are enabled by these very high data rates. So this slide is kind of very similar to what I mentioned in the first few slides about the use cases. But then when we go back to the engineering work behind the scenes, a lot of the work we'll do is then say, kind of proving out, um, you know, what is the actual um, coverage percentage we can get for a given deployment. So we'll get the base station locations, we'll implement these sophisticated propagation models uh, in terms of these various cities, and we can look at what it is the average downlink data rate. So this is, we do a network simulation, so this is where we model, if you learn about propagation and shadowing, and you look at scheduling, uh, we look at the MAC algorithms, there's power control running, uh, you really want to be able to accurately predict things. So the interesting part of like any um, you know, large engineering exercise, the ability to accurately predict is part of the engineering problem because you can design it and you can do a good job, uh, but unless you can kind of prove that it's a good job, people aren't going to really make the investment. And so that aspect of how do you have that reliability that, yeah, I think we've done a good job. We built in a little bit of margin, but we do have to do relatively exhaustive simulations and hence a lot of very careful coding of the algorithms, not only when we actually implement them in silicon, 
but also on the network side. So it's important to differentiate the link, you know, between a transmitter and receiver, that's a link. And then a network is when you have, you know, 50 cells and you have hundreds or thousands of users and you're scheduling all the dynamics. So if you guys understand control theories or loops, this aspect of if someone says go up and you go up and then you went up too high and it's not go down and you go down and I said, no, no, go back up. And then you can get into like hysteresis or ping ponging. The reality is we want to make sure the network is operating smoothly. So a lot of control algorithms become very important. So Qualcomm has kind of a long history of uh, not only hiring Taurus students, but many others to do these interesting kind of control loop optimizations for what is the, how do we make sure some of these loops are decoupled? So rate control relative to power control, relative to mobility or MIMO rank relative to multi-user scheduling. So there's always an optimal solution when everything's static, but what's gonna be more favored is something that can smoothly move through the temporal aspects of the variations. So people are always very curious about how things work in practice because that's when the, the statistical variability becomes more you know, concrete because it's actually moving through a time trace. And so even we'll get like specific time traces for, you know, we're looking at you know, augmented or virtual reality now, we'll have VR streams from various types of content and then we'll try to transmit that over our network simulation and we'll look at what's the performance you get given the fact that you have a latency bound. So I need to actually get 99% of those packets through within say 15 milliseconds. So, or the service doesn't really make sense. People are gonna like, oh, this thing it's not, doesn't work very well. So that you kind of bring in the temporal side with the overall network side. So that's where algorithmically it's very important to understand the time scale that your algorithm's operating at. So you can do all the math and that's a prerequisite to actually get the math right. But if you don't abstract it back to the real physical parameters of the system or the use case, it's never really gonna get deployed. And so this is just a little bit of the further things that are happening where we had that initial baseline, you know, 5G rollouts that are happening in 2019, but we're looking at where it's connected vehicles or how are we doing kind of working in different spectrum bands. So we look at Wi-Fi and 5G, like NR, working in the same band at the same time. What are the sharing mechanisms? You know, if we look at, you know, LBT, like tech techniques, like listen before talk, or the protocol side. So what makes Wi-Fi less efficient than cellular is many times it's the fact that there's an inherent inefficiency in the Mac. So the medium access control, who gets to transmit, when they get to transmit, who's controlling that, who's orchestrating that. So a lot of interesting work on how we can work in unlicensed bands, um, how can we work in industrial IoT where we need a localized deployment. And so this is a little bit on the private network part. So people typically think of cellular as being public in the sense you go to your phone, you go to, you go to your uh, store, you get your subscription, uh, you're paying your monthly bill. But when you try to say, hey, I'm going to have this interesting solution for a factory environment, then you're dealing with a different ecosystem. And the person who owns the factory is like, well, I don't want my data being in the cloud. I need it all on the premises. I don't want it to get hacked. I want, from a security standpoint, I want the data here. I want the network here. No one can roam on to my network. I want a private network. And so this public-private is an interesting part, kind of plays out in many different um, technology industries, but it's this aspect of when you want to have an end-to-end -end vertical ownership of something, uh, how can you deploy it efficiently? So you're, not, you're going to have a, like smaller economies of scale, but you still have a very important use case. So how do you get the best of both worlds where you have something that's designed to support different vertical markets, but can be optimized for each one? So that's kind of more of a marketing uh, product side, but it is this thing that then when you look at how do you design a system, you do have to kind of break it apart that way, or it's not really ever going to kind of see um, the light of day. So this aspect of what would you optimize from a quality of service or latency standpoint for a particular, you know, healthcare or factory application? And then how do you kind of manage and deploy the system? So the network costs, if you look at the cost of deploying a network, you got to get the spectrum, you got to buy the base stations, you got to deploy the base stations, you got to have the backhaul. But more importantly, you also have to operate the thing. So for 10 years, the equipment's going to be sitting there. How do you actually operate it, you know, month in, month out? How many people does it take? How much equipment does it take? You know, how does that operate? So th this is where people would simply talk of CapEx and OpEx, like the money you spend to buy stuff and the money you spend to operate stuff. So from an engineering standpoint, a lot of the optimization work is actually um, going after the, the OpEx side. So how do you make the network more self-managing? You know, how do you make your algorithm so you don't have to fine tune it, that it actually you know, optimizes itself, right? So you can always make a loop and then you make an outer loop to adjust the parameter of the inner loop, right? You're, you're trying to make it so the, self, the system self-learns. And I'll talk in a few slides also about the kind of intersection with machine learning where we look at 
How can the network train itself for some of these future applications? Because the reality is you're not going to go sit there in the factory floor. It's, oh, is that like robot breaking? Okay, I'm going to turn this knob, right? No one does that anymore. So the question is, well, what was the feedback loop that changed something? And so you really have to look at the time scale of what is the real kind of operational side. And so this is just something where if we look at that aspect of, you know, what are the different components that come together uh, in terms of the, the factory? So we're doing measurements. You know, we had our engineering team fly to Germany and kind of sit in various, um, uh, you know, it was like a diesel factories and other factories and kind of just take propagation measurements. So you really understand the physical environment. So 5G is after all wireless. So you really need to understand this isn't about a car driving down the road. This is about, could be an automatic, you know, an AGV, like a robot on the ground going very quickly and having to turn left, turn right. And then there's some robot arm moving at the same time. So what does that environment look like? You kind of have to measure it to be able to uh, understand the system. And so this guide kind of like, takes through some of those examples where what does this mean if we broke this apart from um, a data rate standpoint or a service requirement standpoint? You could have a security camera, sensors, uh, robots. And you can look at then, um, if you were to take a step back from the requirement standpoint, I'm trying to design a wireless network and I wanna, I'm really excited about these factories of the future. I think it's pretty compelling. Well, then what are the um, different scenarios here if we look at a handheld terminal, okay, so what is the latency, the availability, the data rate? Uh, it's not crazy high data rate if it's just a little handheld terminal. But if it's a head-mounted display that's showing you what does a turbine look like, you know, in, in, in particular part you're trying to fix, then it could be gigabits per second because it's a very complicated, you know, image. And I want to do this with very, you know, low latency and get, you know, very good um, availability. But if it's, like, not very good coverage and the guy has to move, like, half a centimeter, it's not a big deal, right? Whereas if it was something where um, it's a sensor or it's something else where it's actually relying and you're not going to, be able to move it around, then the, the requirements will change. Uh, same thing, we look at security cameras, uh, industrial robots, and, and the role of edge computing and, and uh, analytics. So you have to look at kind of the different scenarios that are present in different environment and then what are the kind of, how do the different kind of things come together in a numerical sense? And so these are some of the parts of then of this ultra-reliable low latency communication. So we're trying to design system that um, has the right QoS. So we call it time-sensitive networking. So QoS, we always, you know, joke, is QoS dead? Did, did it ever really happen? Uh, back in EVDO, we had gold, silver, bronze, and then reality, internet was internet, and you got it or you didn't get it, and some packets took longer than others, and everyone just dealt with it. And then you had voice. So you kind of had voice and non-voice. That was the extent of QoS for many, many 3G and 4G networks. So you need to make sure voice worked, and everyone understood what the delay requirements were, just like for those of us who are uh, old enough to have made phone calls that went over the satellite versus fiber for calling overseas, you realize it's pretty frustrating to have that two second delay when it went up to a geo satellite and down and the processing. And all of a sudden you had to like make sure to never cut anybody off and talk pretty slowly. Uh, so voice had its own QoS. But the reality now for all these new services is that QoS is back because these things don't make sense unless we can find a way to guarantee this low latency communication with a certain reliability. And reliability is kind of an overused term because what do we really mean in terms of availability and reliability? So how you deploy the network affects its reliability. Like you can put multiple base stations for diversity. Uh, that's a really good way to improve the robustness of something is just introduce diversity. But then also what about the fact of the physical error rate on the channel? Well, that's where I can always improve reliability at the expense of latency. So the challenge is when you have a kind of a multi-dimensional problem where I want to get low latency. So I want something to be done successfully within five milliseconds. So if I can't, and I have to be like, you know, in this example, like six nines of reliability, then I can't like just retransmit it. If it's 10% error, try again, try again. And eventually I get 0.9, you know, one minus 0.9 to the power, whatever. And you get this IID uncorrelated events. The reality is you actually have to tighten the overall timeline and operate at a lower error rate in the first place. So the whole point of latency and reliability, so how, how often you can do something and then how quickly you adapt or kind of interrelated parameters. And so if we look at then like unlicensed spectrum, so this is an interesting one from a, a kind of research problem where we've been working on it for many years. How can we change the rules for sharing spectrum? So this goes all the way back to the conversations I had at the beginning about government policy and when spectrum is granted, you have unlicensed spectrum. Can you deploy cellular systems in unlicensed spectrum? 
Absolutely, because unlicensed doesn't mean it's it's licensed to Wi-Fi. It means it's unlicensed. As long as you obey the rules of unlicensed, you can operate in that band. And so the the rules are certain things about how much power you can transmit and based on what you're measuring, et cetera. So how can we ensure efficient use of spectrum that increases the capacity or lowers the latency? And so that's this kind of spectrum sharing paradigms where we're looking at what are some new ways of deploying systems so that we can operate a multi-terminal environment uh, efficiently. So aspects of coordinated multipoint, that's when multiple cell sites are working together. So they're, they're sharing information. So what one cell site's gonna do, the other one knows exactly what it's gonna do because it was jointly optimized. So kind of joint versus separate optimization, what can that do for reliability? What can it do for coverage? Uh, what are different ways of predicting resource utilization? And so this is some of those specific examples here where you look at how do you prioritize re, uh, resources if there's a multi-operator scenario? Uh, how can you do like oppor opportunistic sharing if there's unused resources? So you can maybe come up with a fair one, like everybody gets 10 megahertz and I had 40 megahertz, except say, say one of the parties is not present. So do the other three get to use whatever's left over equally so that everyone gets 13.33 megahertz? Or should it be more dynamic? So everyone gets 10 and there's a different set of rules. Like if there's 10 at, at, you know, in play, then as long as you obey uh, certain rules, whoever needs the 10 can use it, right? So between time division multiplexing or you know, hard frequency division binning, there's many, many uh, trade-offs in the middle. So if you look at spectrum as a resource, you know, what's the best way to share it? And it is kind of like an open research problem that there's, if you look at the rules and the way you can share and what's the regulatory framework to have this mix of fairness and quality of service. And if people paid for the spectrum, uh, they don't really want someone else to use it for free. So what's the incentive mechanisms? So there's no perfect solution to this because it brings in uh, economic aspects as well as, you know, notions of fairness and, and uh, how, how was the kind of, what were the rules put in place when the spectrum was auctioned? But it is something where a wide variety of techniques can be brought to bear to improve the efficiency of spectrum sharing. So we still have a very large team working on this because it's something that is also getting addressed in 3GBP. If we look at our you know, Wi-Fi evolutions, it's also very important. And we talk about like the vehicle side uh, and you look at if, if someone's trying to analyze specific use cases and we have a specific research team that's focused exclusively on connected vehicles. So car to car communication, uh, you know, cars talking to roadside units, cars talking to the base station. So, you know, many new cars today, you know, they're already connected to 4G LTE and they'll be connected to 5G so that you can, you know, get updates for your maps and stuff like that. But we're, here we're talking about is deploying stuff where there's rerouting or information from other vehicles, kind of sharing of intent between vehicles. And so you can imagine the complex uh, complexity of rolling out a technology like this because it also involves... Um, is there a federal mandate? So if China says, hey, every car sold in China has to do A, B, or C, or the U.S. government says, the DOT, for example, here, says every car sold on U.S., you know, going forward needs to do some other set of requirements, then it does kind of change the way things get deployed. So things can happen much faster in the presence of a government mandate, the same way the government now mandates backup cameras, right? So they used to, are ABS brakes mandatory? I think they might be now. But sometimes, or seatbelts didn't used to be mandatory, and then it became mandatory. So at a point in time, People say, oh, this is an interesting thing we should do. And then at some point, the government says, actually, everybody has to do it. And that's kind of interesting from an economic standpoint because it, it takes any, um, many times people say, well, I don't want to do it if my competitor is not going to do it and I'm bearing the cost. It's not like, you know, CEOs of companies don't want to do the right thing. But if they're concerned that their competitor might not do it, then it makes it a more complicated decision. So when you have a mandate, then everyone's like, well, that's the new playing field. So yes, it increases, quote unquote, cost to the industry. But the reality is the costs are not that high, almost in many, many examples, because you're kind of averaging out the cost of doing that over many, many units over a long period of time. So it's an interesting um, commentary that when we're looking at more sophisticated technology, what's the regulatory environment to make that commercially successful? And then when we look at something like whether it's connected vehicles or industrial factories, it does become this regional thing. We were talking a little bit um, earlier, if we look at, you know, what is the government policy in the United States relative to Europe, relative to India, relative to Korea, Japan, China, it starts playing out. These different governments want 5G to do different things for their citizens or their industries. So how does Germany approach smart manufacturing versus the United States or versus China? So that does play into how quickly technology gets adopted. And so one of the things for you know engineers on my team and stuff, when we're developing 
uh, technologies, we want to make sure we do have an end-to-end -end understanding of the ecosystem and the regulatory side so that we can influence you know, as appropriate to make sure that a better technology gets deployed uh, and that it's simplified and understood. So many times it's hard to explain all of the details. You're not trying to explain the algorithm, but you are trying to explain the use case in terms of you know, what is some of the safety application of sharing information you know, between vehicles, whether it's plas uh, path planning, sharing perception, real-time updates, coordinated driving. You kind of have to make sure people understand what are the net benefits because deploying it is very, very complicated in terms of, well, I can put it in my car, but if he doesn't have it in his car, what's the use? And you, you kind of slowly get to this environment. The same thing I mentioned, the massive internet of things where what's happening for a longer range, massive scale, power efficiency. If we look at the circuit side, uh, we look at wake up radio. Uh, I was talking to um, you know, you know, Professor Mercier earlier on kind of things like wake up radio and, and power efficient communication. What things are ready for prime time in terms of the real technology as the cellular community sees it. So this is just, I don't expect you to understand all this, but it's just an example I mentioned. Uh, we you know, just finished release 15 and now we're in release 16. And so this aspect of, of how a system for a smart sensor evolves from a standard sense, the aspect of when did you have like, you know, device positioning or support TDD bands or something like wake up radio, or even some of the techniques we're looking at now, non-orthogonal multiple axis. So obviously CMA was non-orthogonal. Uh, other techniques where you're in the same spectrum at the same time and you're not orthogonal from a transmit sense. So the receiver has to separate the users. Well, non-orthogonal has some interesting advantages because I don't have to spend um, time making sure people aren't orthogonal. So you can transmit whenever you want because someone else can be transmit in the same time frequency resource as you because you're not trying to be um, orthogonal. So non-orthogonal is kind of a funny thing to call out in and of itself because most signals are by definition non-orthogonal unless you tried to make them orthogonal. So non-orthogonal multiple access was this big thing as part of 5G saying, hey, should we, you know, 4G was orthogonal, like 3G was or, you know, not orthogonal on the uplink, it was CDMA, it was TDM on the downlink, so essentially orthogonal. Um, and then, you know, 4G kind of went all in on OFDM, O stands for orthogonal. And then 5G is like, well, OFDM was great because we do spatial multiplexing, but should we have some non-orthogonal on the uplink? And Qualcomm said, well, there's some advantages to that. And then a lot of discussions as to the specifics of the advantages in what scenario. Uh, so a lot of um, engineers were looking specifically at things like grant-free uplink, multi-hop mesh. Hey, it'd be pretty cool if a sensor in the basement talked to a sensor upstairs, you know, and then talked out, out of the home. So this aspect of multi-hop mesh, how, how is this going to be kind of play in an actual successful standard? Uh, and so then the other point is then kind of taking a step back. So this is all kind of stuff going on the wireless radios, the 5G side, the radio access network. But then I mentioned, well, this cloud thing is really one of the big changes in the last 10 years. Cloud is here now. It's definitely not going away. Uh, will the cloud move closer to the edge, right? So people, depending which professor you talk to, uh, you know, um, I'm friends with Meng Chang. And so he'll talk of, you know, you talk about fog or you talk about cloudlets. There's many different ways of describing what's moving where in terms of communications and computing, but a lot of applications do involve stuff that is closer to the edge. That is, you don't want it to go all the way to some server that's thousands of miles away and take that latency hit. And maybe you don't even want to from a privacy aspect either. You kind of want it more local. You know, the good example being an industrial factory or information within your own home or your own office. You don't really want it leaving the premises if it doesn't really need to. So how does this kind of wireless edge fit into uh, the communication networks. And this is something also, if you take a step back and say, well, where, where really are we today? Uh, every aspect that is bringing machine learning to bear, a lot of it is happening in the cloud. So it's happening in some server that's far away where all the data is, right? So the data is getting aggregated. It all gets put on some massive kind of football field size scale. And then that's where things are happening. So the question is that we kind of pose is, well, to scale to many of these new use cases, you know, intelligence should be distributed further to the edge. So what does that really mean? Does it mean there's more machine learning algorithms actually running on your device? So from a computing standpoint, uh, I can maybe train the algorithm in the cloud and then transmit the training coefficients to a device that can actually apply them real time without having to go to back and forth through the cloud. And so there's a lot of stuff of inference versus decision making, you know, from, an informa from an information and, um, you know, machine learning context. So this aspect of when you're trying to bring stuff closer to the edge, 
I kind of is kind of changes some of these paradigms a little bit in terms of what's happening, where, and why it's happening. So these are just some of the the benefits in the sense of of you know low latency, privacy, immediacy, efficiency. You know, you're not kind of relaying all this stuff up to the network when maybe only one percent of the information was useful uh, to anybody other than yourself. And so this aspect then of of how does this translate to some of these use cases um, in terms of um, you know, you know, new devices, smart homes, computing, um, you know, replacement cycles and scale. So this also is a little bit of a marketing slide, but it's just meant to kind of uh, have you think about what does it really mean then in terms of where stuff is happening and why it's happening where it's happening. And so some of the benefits along the bottom, but then we kind of start talking, well, let's kind of bring this back to the 5G domain and say, well, um, you know, we're talking about this, these new services. So what are some of the things that happen when we push this intelligence to the edge in a 5G network. So in a, in a 4G network, you talk to the base station, the base station goes from fiber to the core, and then the core, you know, through IP kind of pushes it all the way back to the cloud, and then it can begin the exact, you know, reciprocal journey all the way back to the base station and back to your phone. So is that the best way if I'm going to say, hey, Tara, here's an interesting picture um, that I took last week when I was here, I send it to you, it doesn't go to you, it goes super far away and then all the way back to you, right? So is that the best? Probably not. Is it reasonable? Sure, it's not a big deal, except that I transmitted all this energy from my device just to get to a base station and all this kind of cloud and all this other stuff for no real benefit since the recipient was in the room. So this aspect then of what is the edge cloud, right? Should it be a small cell that has 5G, uh, but it also has some computing? Maybe it has some content storage. So in, in my talks, um, even with, with Suja Day and others as well, what does it make sense in terms of you know, content storage, where should stuff be stored is very important. So a lot of the information now, if we look at the explosion of, of content and it's user generated content, whether you're uploading videos to YouTube or many, many other new scenarios, well, is that, you know, are we just going to just store everything automatic, just store and store and store in this exponential wave? And is that the right thing to do? Or th should there be some more intelligence that starts to make decisions on benefits? And you can look at it, you know, security camera is always a good example. I'm filming my front door in case someone steals my Amazon package. Uh, and there's a whole day went by, nothing happened. Uh, do I need all that data or do I not need it, right? The answer is I don't really need it. Nothing happened, great, good to know, let's move on. Uh, or do I want to store it for some other reason or I'm doing some, you know, other tests. So this aspect of what you should store and when you should store it becomes more inherent. Uh, and so then the question is, what's the trade-off for latency uh, and these other things? So. We can kind of take this a step bigger then. And so let's look at then some of these capabilities that comes into play when I do this. So on the on premise control for low latency in a reconfigurable factory. So this is one of the examples I gave uh, on car intelligence. Yeah, like I don't really need to share a bunch of stuff happening in my car if it's not relevant to other people, but I'd love to get local high definition maps, you know, uh, how to can distribute process uh, for for XR for, you know, AR VR. So what's the right if I'm in San Diego, and now I'm at the UCSD campus. I wouldn't mind if after I park my car today, I could pick up my glasses and say, okay, this is where Atkinson Hall is. This is where this building room is. And then, oh, there's the coffee shop is to the left and this is to the right. So that aspect of immediacy and local, localization of information also means maybe we want to be storing some stuff. You know, maybe there should be some CDN that's connected to all the 5G, you know, hotspots across the campus here. And it doesn't need to be other places, but it could be here and it could be very interesting. Uh, you know, beneficial. And so that aspect of, of localized content. Um, and then we look at then, you know, real time gaming, or we look at the applications of virtual assistants. Same thing you show up in a shopping center. Why is anyone go to shopping centers and just go to Amazon? Or am I going for the experience? And so people who are operating very, very large businesses today are kind of facing this challenge of what's the pr value of, of presence, right? If you're, if you own a football team, sure. Okay. Maybe you're monetizing the NFL rights uh, to the cable operators, but that kind of business is going down. So you still want to sell tickets to the game, but why is someone going to go to the game? And so the, are you getting XR goggles when you go to the game? Well, pretty soon if you don't, uh, other than the cheering and paying for parking and overpriced food, what's the real benefit? Because uh, the experience is less immersive than actually if you put on XR goggles. So there is a lot of challenging aspects of, you know, I think if we look to the next, you know, for these, uh, you know, young master students in the audience, if you look to the next 10, 15, 20 years, a lot of the aspects of local value based on local content um, starts coming into play. And then you can look at then, you know, these, 
these low latency data rates for immersive uh, multimedia, it's okay, sure, I can have like really, really awesome tablets, I can do distributed processing, I can have mobile experience, uh, interactive uh, venues, and what does it mean then when I bring this content aspect with the data rate and latency aspect, and then I can say, okay, what does this mean then for how people are sharing content, creating content, uploading content? And so we can take a specific example of, you know, you're, you're trying to, you're looking at a, a future uh, career where someone's like, you know, a fashion designer, they're trying to understand trends, they're trying to look at designs and trade-offs and materials, and how, how would they leverage, you know, uh, 5G, low latency, high data rate, high def goggles, um, you know, what's the service they're providing, what content is local? So when you look at kind of the broader ecosystem of what is in the edge cloud and how does that translate to some of these use cases, it starts, you could say like, yeah, that kind of makes more sense. These people will be more efficient. Other designs might be more relevant. It's a faster time to market. This kind of whole fast fashion trend, which I'm not a big participant in directly myself, but I'm certainly aware of it. Um, those companies are, you know, got designs into stores so quickly, it really changed the retailing environment uh, versus going to Macy's and saying, hey, what's in the fall wardrobe versus no, it's in the store like two weeks after, you know, someone conceived of it closer to the factory. Uh, the same thing we look at then, size, weight, power. So where's the evolution of glasses that look kind of like mine, but start projecting additional information. And so then you could say, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, high sensitivity microphones, haptic sensors, where it's just telling me, hey, John, you only have 10 minutes left, time to kind of wrap it up. Uh, in the old days, people would hold up like 10 minutes left, or some audiences it would go red, green, blue, or, or is it just like an implicit thing, which is a kind of socially acceptable, not a big deal, informal notification. And so what's that aspect of the sensors that are in the glasses, the eye tracking, uh, optics and projection technologies, you know, durable, semi-transparent display. So sometimes it's just regular glasses just doing your stuff. Sometimes it's telling you additional information. And so a lot of these technologies are kind of coming together. And so, okay, let's bring this again in the 5G context of, I could have some, you know, premium XR anywhere type device, but then how do I get these photorealistic graphics and visuals and how much processing is in, in the device versus in the network. If I put it all on the device, it's going to be too heavy. It doesn't quite make sense. Uh, if I put it, you know, all in the network, uh, it's too low, like too long latency. Like it's not fast enough. And so you kind of enter this hybrid thing where like any engineer problem is, if you've ever worked for a while, then everything's always like a hybrid solution. So you present these two dichotomies and say, oh, I have a breakthrough paper because it brings them together. But this is an example of that where you say split rendering. So some processing is in the cloud, some is on device, some is in the edge cloud. Right, so you have far away, near, on you, right? So this notion of, of where things are happening and why they're happening there. So what sort of stuff should be on the device? Uh, what sort of stuff should be farther away? And this is an example where, you know, as this guy moves, you know, his six degrees of freedom head pose, well, he can do on-device calculations to compensate because his head knows exactly how he moved from his sensors in the glasses. But the network needs to know, okay, from a content standpoint, the guy's head moved. So what is done, you know, kind of on device um, versus in the network is something where even as we speak, uh, we have many engineers that I work very closely with, we're analyzing this in the 5G network context where we have the data rate distributions uh, and the iframes and the preframes and the packet size based on a certain resolution per eye. And, you know, what's, what information is flowing this way? What happens at the edge cloud versus what goes here saying, okay, it's a new like longer term solution versus there's local information being done in the edge cloud and there's on-device communication. So this is just kind of an example of we look end-to-end -end of um, we look at 5G in this broader economic regulatory new use case environment and then we look at what at the end of the day um, you know we're hiring mathematicians, computer scientists, signal processing engineers, you know Mac optimizers, security experts because to bring any of this kind of end-to-end -end, you need to look at all the different aspects of it. So I know one of the, the challenges I had when I was a graduate student was kind of multiplexing between that kind of macro and micro part, where in school you kind of want to be a, a deep expert in something, kind of, kind of prove your utility in a specific sense. But at the same time, you always end up operating in a general framework, whether it's a company or a university or even in, in some sort of government role. It's this aspect that you have to kind of context switch between macro and micro. And I think one of the important things is... Um, to kind of you know benefit from the macro perspective but you really have to do kind of micro level deep work where you're not really advancing the field so for this field to advance 
of this split AR VR, the computer vision people need to do better computer vision. They don't have to start worrying about security. The security people need to do better security. Yes, people need to think about security and computer vision and cloud storage, but it's okay to be an expert as long as you operate within the framework of the general benefit. So that's just not to be too paternalistic, but there's that aspect of, as you're looking at your kind of research projects as graduate students, that you, you want to make sure there's some you know, end-to-end -end relevance to the broader problem you're solving, but you really have to solve a statistical uh, specific problem that actually moves the field you're publishing in forward. And so it is something to kind of be comfortable with that imperfection that you're never going to be perfect generalist and perfect specialist. But at this point, it's more important to be a specialist, in my opinion, because the generalist stuff will always come as you know, things move through the system. So that kind of concludes the talk. And uh, I want to thank Nambi for this opportunity and, and UCSD for being such a great partner to Qualcomm and so many other things. So thank you. Just to, just to this, this is a fantastic talk. I really hope the students uh, appreciated the uh, breadth of the coverage that uh, uh, Dr. John Smith did, uh, covering a whole range of problems. Uh, uh, you know, really, uh, I think uh, uh, every one of those slides, I think thinking through with the, hopefully with the video, go back and think about it. I think every one of them is a research problem on its own, every one of these slides. So I think uh, you can turn it into everything from an independent project to a master's thesis to PhD thesis based on the depth. So uh, I think uh, uh, really thank you. I think you t uh, took my uh, wish to heart in terms of saying, please highlight uh, interesting research problems. And I think you did a great job here. So let us open the floor up for questions. Yeah. Yes. Oh, thank you. And then if you want to use the microphone, I think it'll, I, I was instructed to notify you to use the microphone just to make sure it's captured for posterity. So let me repeat. So let me thank you again for your energy, enthusiasm, and inspiration for our students. I think they benefit oh, thank you. a lot. Very much so. So my question is, I mean, you know, one thing, you know, I look 5G, you know, compared to full GLT is, I mean, even though it is not really monolithic, I mean, things are very modular, but 5G is really covering everything, you know, licensed, unlicensed, and now you are talking about, you know, share spectrum. So in terms of, you know, spectrum, you know, there are many different modes, and also there are big three modes for different use cases. And in fact, you're talking about smart factories, so on and so forth. So I think, I mean, 5G is kind of competing with pretty much all wireless technologies out there. And in some sense, you know, we are competing with Wi-Fi and also for factory optimization, robotics, so on and so forth, they have their own proprietary, you know, technologies, but 5G is kind of getting in there and competing with these alternatives. So what is your view, you know, how successful 5G will be when the, you know, front line is pretty much everywhere? Sure. No, I, I think that's uh, always an important point that we call it, you know, boiling the ocean when you're trying to do too much, trying to be, it's great for everybody and it's perfect for nobody. It's always a dangerous spot to be, but it is something where we have enough specific engagement. So we can take the smart factory example, or we can take another example, because obviously, you know, the, the devices will be, you know, 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi, right? We're not saying that a Wi-Fi is irrelevant in the future. What, and obviously Qualcomm's a big, you know, Wi-Fi silicon provider as well, and also active participant in the Wi-Fi standards. Uh, whether it's AD or AX, AY, et cetera. So it is something where what's important is to understand from a spectrum standpoint and a deployment standpoint how the different technologies work together. So it's, we're not saying that um, there's no role for Wi-Fi in devices, or if we look at the factory, we feel that like a, a controlled 5G deployment that's optimized can definitely achieve a better uh, spectral efficiency, better latency, and better reliability. So given those key metrics, uh, we do feel that what's important to be successful, for example, in the industrial ecosystem is that we specifically engage the industrial ecosystem and also look for partners. So whether it's Bosch or Siemens or others who are new to wireless, they also want to leverage 5G. So what is true is that it may be perceived that, oh, 5G is trying to do everything, but that's also a little bit of response to the fact that people understood that, you know, 4G cellular networks are very good. They really solved high data rate mobility, they saw, if we look at, you know, these ITU numbers I threw up for what 5G was promising to be 10 times better a year, like all the good stuff gets 10 times better, all the bad stuff gets 10 times worse, right, as I simply describe it. But it is this thing where 4G really did achieve its goals relative to 3G and 2G of 
here we are all carrying these awesome smartphones that are doing these great data rates. We would have before thought it was crazy to watch Netflix on a smartphone and you you tell your kid like, turn it off. You're going to like kill the family's data plan in one second or 10 seconds of, you know, gigabits per second throughput. But so the important thing is 5G was riding on top of that significant, you know, success of LTE. And because of that, 5G does have the bandwidth in its ecosystem to be focusing more on these verticals. So the role of the vertical markets is very important because it's the next frontier. So mobile broadband is kind of a given, which is why it's happening in release 15 already. So all the operators who are deploying globally in, in 2019, whether it's in China, Korea, Europe, or United States, they're all deploying mobile broadband, essentially. So more of the same stuff. But when we look to release 16 and beyond, and the fact that the same way LTE had like eight releases, then things will get phased out. So something like factory communications, it will take its time. It's a complicated value chain of like, who would we sell silicon to? Who would we partner on the service with? How is the, the network deployed and operated? So you can look at a deployment side, an operational side, a service side, and all of those, those three things together are what's going to make it successful. So that's where 5G, it's not like people are going to like email this slide deck to a factory owner and say, hey, do you want to deploy? No, we would have to actually work very actively. And we do have both on the product management side and the, the research and development side, active uh, ecosystem engagements so that we can see well, what is the real value given that 5G is having this global scale of NRE, right, of investment and silicon and base station, you know, complexity and device complexity, it can be leveraged into the factory. So to be successful to into a new adjacent market, it often comes down to the accounting of the original investment, you know, who paid for that and how was then you're projecting the differential investment to be successful. So if you have a great 5G smartphone, you already have a pretty darn good 5G factory solution. If you want a great 5G factory solution, it's only a little bit more work. So the same thing for an infrastructure vendor like an Ericsson, Nokia, or Huawei, for them to sell into a factory, it's actually only a little bit more work once they've sold for broad scale commercial success in broadband. So I think that's the point that people, it's a conditional probability. You have to kind of reflect and project after you've already taken that first vector where you've already actually have a lot of capabilities. And so that's true of the standard and it's true of the product side. And I think it's hard to understand because it's true if you're not an expert, the standard looks like, oh my gosh, it must be a mess. In reality, it's a pretty careful plan. There's meetings, like I said, for five, the people who are talking about channel coding are not in the same room uh, as the people talking about MIMO, let alone the people talking about, you know, coding, I mean, uh, network security or other things. So it really is a, this reflects the size of the ecosystem that it can be this kind of uh, specific, a uh, sum of many parts solution. But it's a very good question about, you know, how you approach a vertical market in the presence of a very complicated system. Any other questions be happy to answer? Yes, Tara. I guess my question is also related, but maybe from a different angle. So for a long time, I've been thinking like classic networking. We modularize everything in order to coexist and like really allow a lot of um, sort of um, different algorithms to work together. So you have a very loose uh, sort of interoperability con constraints and then you let the system sort of evolve. So the network as a whole becomes really un underutilized. And then you sort of have this managed world of cellular which even when it was to serve uh, data or voice, it, it was actually really uh, you know optimizing the stack just because the, the pipes were not good enough to do this kind of wasteful allocation. So and then you take that view and you think uh, data center networking, people sort of let go of that general rules. TCP got reinvented for data center and like there were different kind of schedule congestion control and so on. Is there something that 5G has l taught us in terms of like factories and so that we can think about like specialized networks that we can now yeah. think about like redesigning or rethinking some of those things that... Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good uh, question that we're, you know, are we just designing a, a generic QoS algorithm that can handle all these things at the same time? Or are we saying, uh, and I think that's a very important, that's why I mentioned like coordinated multi-point processing, something that's a little tricky to do on a macrocellular network given the latencies between the base stations. And then what are the real benefits when, you know, I'm getting like more than 10 dB more signal from my serving cell than an interfering cell, which means my SNR is already like 10 dB, you know, because it's 10 over one, right? 
And then I said, well, I have this great algorithm that the one can go away. I'm like, okay, great. I can go from 10 dB higher if the one went away, but I could probably have done something at the device to project away from that one already. So did I really need the base station to do something differently? Because that one that you're seeing from the base station was serving a different user in his cell. So the sum capacity was kind of, was it really helped that much by coordinated multipoint? But if you say to your, to your specific question, hey, I'm designing for a factory. I'm actually not designing for some throughput, you know, how many consumers are going to pay X dollars per month for data. I'm actually designing for reliability or the thing doesn't make sense. Uh, so if you design for latency or you design for reliability or you design for latency and reliability, then all of a sudden, yeah, you do rethink the algorithms fundamentally because you're not, like a lot of this stuff is implicitly designed for capacity. I think we take for granted as system engineers, whether it's information theory or comm, the yeah, capacity is the most important one because gosh darn that spectrum is so important. But when you get to millimeter wave and you have a huge amount of bandwidth, like 800 megahertz for a given operator is not infeasible, then all of a sudden you want to design for link budget again. We call it like C over I or C over N, right? So CDMA was great because there are multiple cellular reuse, voice activity factor, all the stuff in Viterbi's original paper. And that was kind of designed for coverage for a particular QoS. But you say a factory is actually very, very different. I want to design for reliability and latency. Huh, so those are the KPIs I'm going to optimize. And capacity, I get what I get. Obviously, more is always better, so I'm not going to do anything stupid. But if I design my algorithms for reliability and latency, then absolutely we would rethink from the start, which is what we are doing in terms of how do we do the scheduling? How do we make sure that from a, like a latency standpoint, we're hitting you know, the right metrics? Sure. When I think the interesting point is, yeah, whether we would say the standards have taught or the body of work that went into the standards is shared widely, you know, um, I would say, yeah, I don't know. I guess I don't have a perfect example to explain, but I guess we would hope that the output of the research community is kind of being digested more broadly. I think it's almost something that's going to happen more and it's already happening where, you know, whether people are changing companies and going on and like, oh, this person used to work for, you know, uh, a certain type of company, and now they're going to work for an industrial company. So it's more like all it takes is a few engineers to change companies who are bringing with them not proprietary information, but bringing with them a knowledge base from the cellular community into a new application. So it's like when a hospital hires someone who's worked at Verizon for 10 years, or we have a good example, many companies will hire a chief medical officer. Hey, let's get a doctor here because we're doing enough stuff that's medical. We kind of need someone who understands end-to-end the value proposition of delivering medical services and doctors and patients and billing and operations. And all of a sudden they're consulting, whether it's GE Healthcare or Qualcomm or Intel or some of these other companies. And so you have that transfer of knowledge uh, by bringing in domain experts, or you have it by even the, the local experts um, within the new industry that could benefit from it, participating in, in academic conferences in a given area. That's why I do think uh, 5G, even though it does, it's, it's true, it has gotten a lot of like marketing uh, push, it's also something where it's given a certain energy to the communications ecosystem, whether it's a Globecom and ICC and ISFT, um, et cetera, where all of a sudden uh, people are talking a lot about wireless algorithms again. And that does kind of, people are thinking about things a little differently and even describing it a little differently, which does increase the probability of it getting adapted to some of these other markets. But I think that's a good point that, you know, it just doesn't happen automatically that people have to kind of think about it to kind of see it through. So, how about some questions from students? Anyone? Yes. Uh, actually, I, I'm from optics area, so Good. I'm. Uh, you know, optics plays an important role in millimeter wave signal processing. So, can you have a specific comments on how? Uh, how optics plays a role in the 5G uh, sure. in the millimeter wave range. Yeah, and by optics, I don't, you don't mean like fiber optic communication, like laser photodiode stuff. You mean optics in the sense of, of um, yeah, the signal processing. I, I think it's something when we look at beamforming and we look at the array side. So we gave some examples of, of, you know, what does it take, for example, for Qualcomm to put a millimeter module into a smartphone, right? And we look at the, the lens and we look at the, the, um, like the element gains 
and then we look at the array opportunities across, you know, by choosing complex weights across each of those arrays, uh, each of those elements. So there is some work when we look at kind of beam forming and we look at like techniques, we even use the words like squinting internally. When we look at, if you try to do everything very beam based, it can have a, a consequence that everything is happening too fast, you know, versus non beam based is you're just like projecting to the whole cell. So to go back to this dichotomy argument, you can say, okay, 3G, you just radiated over 120 degrees a signal that was spread that wide. Whereas you say, okay, 5G is radiating over 10 degrees, very narrow beams. But then when you first turn on your phone, you have to acquire the system. You're listening to a broadcast signal. So how do we do the beam transmission for broadcast <coughs> relative to unicast? So broadcast is when I don't know yet I'm serving you. I'm just serving the cell. I don't mean like broadcast as in everyone, like it's like the same content, but it's something where I'm trying to send information across the whole cell or I'm trying to do unicast, which is, oh, I'm choosing it to serve you. I have the CSI you, you sent me and I'm going to do some really sophisticated thing directed right to you versus I'm sending something uh, just in case you turn on your phone. Any one of you turn on your phone, you have to listen to the signal. So that does get into some of the aspects of how do we do the code book design in terms of, you, you know, can we use a narrow beam and do some interesting things to have a broad coverage, you know, other than obviously stepping quickly through a lot of angles. So if you're an optics expert, uh, that's just some examples of some of the challenges we face is the difference between efficient broadcast and efficient unicast. And efficient unicast is inherently about being more directional and better MIMO, better you know, leveraging of reflections and, and spatial processing, where some of the challenges then is broadcast. How do I support a large number of users um, given that I've built this network that's relying on steering? So we actually often face this many, many other interesting problems in information theory. We kind of always assume we're talking about the data channel where someone's trying to do high spectral efficiency, whereas many times you can be control channel limited. Like you have to send someone, hey, what is the data rate you're going to get on the data channel? So the power consumption, I got to wake up every millisecond even in LTE, and I, did I get data or not? Did I get data or not? Did I get data or not? So you're always waking up, demodulating the control channel. Okay, nothing for me. Oh, something for me. And so you have to do that every millisecond to know whether you got something or not. And um, that's how your system operates at a certain latency. So then that control channel design and optimization is very different than, yes, I am giving you data, and now it's the data channel. And then the broadcast channel is one step removed from that, where you're just always sending it so that if a new phone, as an example, if someone flies here from a different city, their phone's off, they land in San Diego, they turn their phone on, what do they hear from the network? Because they listen first. And so that signal that they first hear is obviously not steered to them, and it's not a control channel, it's a broadcast channel. And so that aspect, then you have to think of the different physical realities of, is it one to many, you know, the one to many, many to one inf information theory context, but more importantly, in the how is power being allocated? What's the link budget of that channel? So we'll look at the uplink and downlink control channel link budget versus the broad just, uh, broadcast channel link budget versus the data channel link budget. So just long story short, it's something like Massive MIMO, it's great for capacity. I have to use it for coverage because my network's being deployed at a certain intrasite distance. So the network makes no sense if I can't close the control channel at the edge of the cell, but I can close the data channel. And if I can't close the broadcast channel, nothing's happening. So anyway, so it's just how do you do your, your statistical um, allowance for variability in terms of margin? Like you kind of design for margin just in case, you know, there's a bad propagation event in terms of, you know, coverage or you're behind a tree or you're in an elevator or whatever. Uh, it's all these things have to be taken into account without wasting too much uh, kind of energy and power. Yep. Uh, what kind of a millimeter, millimeter wave architecture is like company thinking of like, how are those, so uh, in millimeter wave, for example, we are uh, expecting to have much more antennas as compared to the number of RF chains. So how are these antennas going to connect to the RF chains and some like? Yeah, so it's kind of a hybrid architecture because you're right that, you know, on a device we might look at having multiple subarrays and then within a subarray we would have steering. Uh, so in terms of um, the notion of um, RF beamforming versus, you know, baseband. So 
you do need a fair amount of RF beam forming in millimeter wave. So there's kind of no getting around the fact that at that wavelength, you do have to kind of, from an aperture size standpoint, you do have to put some directionality into the signal, which means you're, you're focusing, obviously, um, you're going to put that into RF beam forming. And then the as aspect of when do I use baseband is about when do I want to do more sophisticated things uh, that are above that. And for example, to, to you know, Nambi's question on when would I do spatial multiplexing MIMO in millimeter wave, the answer is, well, not too much, but you can do a little bit uh, in certain scenarios. Um, and the other thing of millimeter wave is it's important to look at the base station side, which is also a pretty small cell. You know, the antenna array like this can have 256 antenna elements in it. Uh, and so when you look at the infrastructure deployment, uh, we still look at beam searching and beam tracking on the infrastructure side. And then the sophistication of that number of antennas, it might be, you know, whether it's four times more antennas or eight times more antennas than a device, the device will still have quite a few more than you think, whether it's 16 or 24 or 32. There's a lot of different trade-offs to be made based on the form factor of the device. So RF relative to, to baseband um, is something that is, is important to kind of get right, and it will depend on the scenario. So there's no like perfect solution that, oh, RF is always the only thing you ever have to do, or baseband is always the perfect thing. Uh, the reality is it's, you often end up in these hybrid scenarios, but the hybrid would generally tilt towards more RF than baseband, um, at least when you're deploying for coverage. And then over time, there'll be other scenarios where you bring in more baseband um, you know, complexity. And then just to, just to add to what John said, if you think about the cell phone design, you can say there is a war of space, right? For every single thing is competing for space. And you know we would all love to have longer battery life. So that uh, takes up a huge chunk of space. And then you now have to start thinking about with blockage due to millimeter and so on, how do you essentially distribute these antennas or the sub areas very carefully? So you know you actually have reasonable ability to close the link margin and things of that kind. So the handset design is a very interesting problem. And I think you alluded to it, yeah. saying, hey, you know, we are actually looking at all those. Yeah, so we have many, many engineers who are focused specifically on the handset side. And then we have other engineers who are focused on the base station side. And then there's other hybrid things like you know, if someone's doing fixed wireless access, so given the amount of bandwidth, mm. you know, I don't know how many of you in your dorms or in your student apartments have like, you know, Wi-Fi at home in the sense you're paying a cable company or a phone company to deliver fiber or cable to your home. Would you be intrigued by a, you know, something you put there near the window or outside the window that's actually beam forming to a base station and then doing, you know, say Wi-Fi or inside the home. And so that ability as these bands get higher and the bandwidths get wider, the other interesting reality is, is as you've all noticed from, you, you know, the consolidation in certain industries is the, the telecom industry relative to the cable industry. And is the cable industry, what does it really look like 10 years from now? Who is pretty complicated, right? Given that all the video content, whether it's Amazon or Netflix or YouTube, it's kind of a different media universe. So it's also obviously not the context here, but when you look at, at uh, media content and what people are, are um, and you look at distribution, a lot of these big fights, whether it's with the Federal FTC uh, in the government, where there's a takeover that is or is not approved uh, by the administration, it kind of gets into consumer choice and consumer benefit. And to that point, uh, an externally mounted antenna that's doing 5G millimeter wave um, is pretty interesting because all of a sudden, Someone could say, hey, if you have a data plan for your smartphone for another $20 a month, you get this little box, you can stick it outside, um, then you have it at home. And some people would say, that's kind of handy because I don't get great coverage you know, in certain parts of my home, but I don't really want to pay $50 a month to have internet to my home when I'm at UCSD 12 hours a day. And so that trade-off and how that rolls across uh, the full scale of um, you know, the um, uh, demographics of income and, and benefit is also something that in different countries is very different. You know, whether you're in Korea and there's incredibly high data rates everywhere, there's a lot of fiber in Korea, or you go to Europe uh, and there's not really cable TV in the same way, uh, or in all the you know building construction and stuff. So it's an interesting reality that that in this global ecosystem, there is some things that are very uh, different. Whether we're talking like Ramesh and I about India and how 5G would get deployed in India, and how even uh, in the early days. Uh, when I was at Bell Labs in 97, we were looking at a technique like air loop, kind of doing fixed wireless to the home in the mid 90s. And so what does that look like, you know, pre-internet revolution versus, versus nowadays? So the spectrum and transmission and content, 
then I'll kind of have these complicated interplays. So long story short is that um, uh, if we look at, at you know, smartphones and base stations, there's also some interesting stuff in between where, whether it's a concentrator or if you look at a factory, you know, um, this aspect of it, it's like a connector node that's kind of like a base station, but doesn't have full base station functionality, but maybe it's plugged in, right? So this aspect of relays in a generalized sense of what is the power characteristics, the energy characteristics, can it be more complex, more expensive, but it allows other stuff to be less complex and less expensive. And so this notion of like, you know, it's not just the two ends of the extreme of a big expensive base station and a really, you know, low power phone, there's actually some interesting stuff in between. And we've seen, you know, startups, you know, look at things, whether it's Starry or others as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you know those folks, but yeah. it is a kind of interesting where people say, I'm going to just go for it. I'm going to try it and see what yeah, happens. 38, 38 gig, yeah, 38 gig. And yeah. But that's a, kind of a good question on, on the, uh, you know, the, from the hybrid beamforming standpoint. Wonderful. Why don't we conclude? Yep. Uh, yep. All right. Thank well, thanks very, very much. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah.